Aloha to you at home in your bathroom or your bedroom or your garage or your living room. We're glad you're here and we're glad you're here in person. When you think about it, if we loved, especially if we love as Jesus calls us to love, there would be no conflict in the world. Well, there may be conflict, but certainly we would not see wars, we would not see divorces, we would not see abuse. God is love, and love is the most powerful force there is because God is love. And so we understand, therefore, that before Jesus went to the cross, he was resurrected and he was ascended, that part of his final charge is that we were to love each other. He told his disciples to do that. And today, as his disciples, his command transcends that era. It's a charge that we inherit and we are called to live today. But when you step back, whether you see the exploding rate of divorces out of the pandemic because people have been strained in how to navigate their children going to school, making a living, doing both at one time, being cooped up in one place, you understand that we need a biblical purview of love, not a human, cushy, romantic, Hollywood entertainment industry performance arts kind of human love that is transactional, emotional, and merit driven, but we need a biblical love. And so Jesus leaves us with this command. In John chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another, for by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So to love one another is Christ's command. He says, a new commandment I give to you, and the commandment was new because Jesus was using uh, that, a, a very little used word called agapeo. And there were four primary Greek words. Remember that the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And so you go back to the original language, Jesus was using the word agapeo, which basically meant you love on the basis of rightness, virtue, nobility, and sacrifice rather than merit and emotion. Because it's easy for all of us to love those that love us. It's easy for me to love my three daughters and my wife and dog. But it's not that easy to love those who don't love me. And yet Jesus' command is that we actually choose to love those that are not easy to love. That we don't polarize, but we unite. And so it was a radical new commandment that was unlivable apart from a relationship with Jesus. Because it is the grace of God that allows us and empowers us to love according to the will of God. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, through love, serve one another. For the whole law, all of Scripture is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor, agapeo, your neighbor, as yourself. And let me just say about love being a command here. We generally don't need to be commanded to do something that is natural, that is something that's easy or something that we want to do. I don't need to command you. The Lord doesn't need to command all of us to eat lunch today. Right? I personally have a weakness for hostess Twinkies. I know you can't tell by my physique, but my dream cheat dessert is not a custard pie, it's not a Chantilly cake, it's Hostess Twinkies and a little bit of coffee, and it will give me a high. <laughs> On a rare occasion, I will sneak away to 7-Eleven. My wife doesn't know this. Buy Twinkies, drink coffee, and feel great. The problem with that is Hostess Twinkies are not good for you. They're not good for your health. Right? I don't need to be commanded to eat Hostess Twinkies. I have a natural gift and affinity for Twinkies. I'm glad, by the way, they brought it back. You know, for a short time, they were extinct. So Jesus here is commanding us 
to love because the kind of love he calls us to love with is different than the human love alone. So we are to love as Jesus loved. He says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So how did Jesus show his love? Well, we know 1 John chapter 5, the great apostle of love, John, says, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So Jesus demonstrated. He demonstrated his agape love through tangible, physical, practical action, which speaks of the expressions that prefer serve and sacrifices for others. It is selfless, not self-serving. The Apostle Paul put it this way in the great book of Colossians. Put on then, he says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. We looked at this last week. So you also must forgive. But he goes past forgiveness. And he says, above all these, beyond and above forgiveness, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Twice in this text, he says, he uses the term put on, which in the Greek simply means this, putting on an external garment. It's literally it meant to, to put on your clothes externally. What is the principle we are to put on love because what we wear on the outside will eventually become who we are on the inside, okay? We act our way by faith and the grace of God into feeling. Most of us won't do something unless we feel like doing it. But biblical love, as Jesus was using in our opening text, refers to acting your way by faith into loving and that you can eventually feel what you act. I go to the gym regularly. I've done it for years, which is why I have this marvelous skinny frame today. Bad genetics requires me to work, work out. However, I never feel like working out. I've been working out regularly since I've been about 23. I'm 43 today. <laughs> I used to be able to say that, and people go, we believe you. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> and I never feel like going to the gym. I never feel like taking a jog. I never feel like going on the treadmill. I never feel like grabbing those dumbbells. I never feel like working out. But the battle is choosing, by the grace of God, to get there and to take the first few steps or take the first few reps. And then I begin to feel it. Yesterday was one of those days. Biblical love and obeying the commands of Scripture works the same way. By faith, not feeling, we choose to put on the qualities of virtue described here. We looked at forgiveness last week, but it's not just forgiveness. God forgives, but He is love. And if we're going to become like Jesus, which is the goal of our Lord, to transform us by his love to love, then we have to understand that all of us can love counterintuitively those who are hard to love by putting on love. You can act loving and eventually you will feel loving because that's the Holy Spirit working a genuine, authentic transformation in our soul first and it imparts to the souls of others. Last week, for those of us who were not here in the auditorium or at home, Pastor Billy Lyle did a marvelous job preaching on forgiveness, teaching on the specifics of forgiveness, and then re causing us to revisit an incident in 2018 that riveted the country and parts of the world. And just the context before we go to video and review part of it, 26-year-old Amber Geiger, 
Dallas police officer walked into an apartment she thought was hers, but mistakenly walked into another man's apartment on a different floor. She had worked long hours, had become disoriented, and as she entered the apartment, which was unlocked, she saw an intruder that was a threat and shot him to death using her weapon. He was a black man. His name was Botham John, a 26-year-old youth pastor. That incident rocked the world. It rocked the country. It certainly rocked the city of Dallas. And it became an ongoing, controversial, very emotional courtroom drama. The deceased brother, Brent John, took the stand and chose to forgive him repeatedly. But what we want to look at this morning is he chose to express unconditional agapeo love as a Christian, committed believer who knew what his brother would have wanted. And so let's revisit that part here as we continue our journey. Speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone but I don't even want you to go to jail I want the best for you because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do and the best would be give your life to Christ I'm not gonna say anything else I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Twice, he says, I love you. In other words, I agapeo you. Twice he said it, and then he asks presiding judge Tammy Kemp for permission to hug her. Understand, this is a white police officer shooting a black man who was his dear brother and a pastor, and he chooses twice to say, I love you, and then asks for permission to hug her. It was said that when he hugged her, people could see she was transformed during the hug. Another observer said, you could feel the Lord enter the room. The reason for the delay when he asked presiding judge Tammy Kemp for permission to hug her was that Tammy Kemp initially was going to deny him the, the right to do that because it had never been done before. This would be unorthodox. But she explains now in part two, our next video, why and what happens in her own heart that ensues. So let's take a look. 
Can I give her a hug, please? It's the moment that for a few seconds seemed to bring the world together and embrace. Both of John's brother Brand had asked Judge Tammy Kemp if he could hug Amber Geiger, his brother's killer. And I was wanting to say no, but I couldn't. And then when he said the second please, I just felt like I could not deny him this. I thought it would be cathartic for him. I hoped it would be helpful for Ms. Geiger. Then Judge Kemp stepped off the bench to console both of John's family. And I told them that I was happy to have learned about their son because he seemed to be an amazing individual. She says she looked around the courtroom and saw black and brown on one side and white on the other. So she turned to Geiger, not wanting her to feel neglected. And I just simply said to her, uh, Brent Jean has forgiven you. Please forgive yourself. She says Geiger asked her if she thought her life could still have purpose. And she asked me, did I think God would forgive her? And I said, yes, he will. And she said, well, I don't have a Bible. I don't own a Bible and I don't know where to start. And that's when I said to her, I will get you a Bible. So she went to her chambers, got her Bible, and gave it to Geiger. She told her to turn to John 3:16, and they read the Bible together. She says Geiger asked her for a hug, not once, but twice. When I looked at her and saw how she was hurting, of course I agreed to give her a hug. And so we did. Judge Kemp repeatedly wiped away tears as she recounted those moments. She says she's confused that some people would criticize her for having this human moment. And I did feel led to give her a Bible because I did not want her to go back over to the jail and to become bitter and to not allow the seed that was planted not to be nurtured and brought to fruition. She says despite the fact that some people thought she overstepped her role as a judge, she says she would do the same thing again. In Dallas, I'm Rebecca Lopez. Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson said, quote, I will never ever forget the incredible examples of love, faith, and strength that was personified. When Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, this is exactly what he was talking about. This is the kind of love that diffuses divorce, separation, abuse, and world wars, to be quite frankly. A black woman hugging, sharing the gospel with, declaring love and forgiveness and hope to a white woman during a racially heated time who had shot a black man who was in the prime of life and a pastor. You can't make this up. But God in His sovereignty allowed it, and two people with great theological understanding of God's unconditional love, Brant John, brother of the deceased, and presiding judge Tammy Kemp, a devout Christian, went to the Word of God and instead of ministering hate and retribution, ministered the love of the gospel. God so agapeled the world that he gave his only begotten son. The innocent Savior died for all of us who are guilty. And they, and they took the Word of God and biblical love and they shocked the world. Imagine if every one of us would do this. Imagine if we put the Tom Cruise love aside. Imagine if we put aside the J-Lo's and the Ben Afflecks. No offense, and I'm not judging them. But I'm saying our world gets our teaching about love from all the wrong people and all the wrong places. We've got to get it from the book of love called the Bible. And... We have to understand this, and this is where we bring it down today. Love is the fruit of discipleship that points to God. You saw two disciples of Christ, presiding judge Tammy Kemp and brother of the sea, of deceased Brant John. Verse 35, we go back to our opening text. By this, by this, what we just saw, by this in God's word, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if, if, you have love one for another. So love is the ultimate language that highlights Jesus. Every time we choose to love, we point 
to the source of that love, our Lord, because God is love. That's who he is, Scripture says. When we love, we reflect God, and we cause people to reference and to reverence God, whether they like it or not. Because the people, they go, why do you do this? How, how does that, that's so incredible. Where do you get that from? Him. Judge Kemp broke open the Bible, broke open God's Word, rendered prayer, and a hug. People in the courtroom said they, could, they literally saw Officer Amber Geiger transformed. And very, it very, I mean, that's a rare statement. You maybe expect that at a church conference, not in a courtroom of justice. Except the Lord entered the room because where there is love, there is God, because God is love. Think about it. The Lord who lives in us wants to love through us and transform the world. He wants to transform your world. He wants to transform your marriage. He wants to transform your family. He wants to transform your friendships. He wants to transform your business. He wants to transform your campus. He wants to transform your community. And it, everybody who's a Christ follower and a discipler and a disciple maker would choose to love, we change the world. Great Mother Teresa said, all we got to do is do it one life at a time. Which life is in your world for you to love? I'm talking about the ones that are like, it takes extra grace. The extra irritating. Anybody have people like that right now? Careful now. You may be that person to the other person. <laughs> now, Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love, shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, not when we, had, not when we were well or cleaned ourselves up, because that's not possible, but we were still sinners, Christ died for us in our flawed, imperfect, imperfect state. That's when love shines the most. So Jesus commands us to share this gospel of love to others, and he's therefore left us with these last words. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, because when we do that, we cause people to see God, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age when love was demonstrated and the word of God was broken open in the courtroom. As witnesses have said, you could feel God, his presence in the room. There's something happens when we go and express love that God shows up, that his manifest presence appears. And his presence wants to break out everywhere now. Yes, even in Ukraine where there is war going on in an unjust invasion and incursion, the Ukrainian people were the church, and we have seven churches there, seven churches representing our spiritual families there right now. And I want to read to you, this is Chris, the CBN network, just profiling the spirit of a couple churches that have chosen to stand and to share love. Here on the front lines of Ukraine, the church is standing strong, it is written, and at least one case, it just happens to be physically, it just happens to physically stand right between Kiev, which is the capital of Ukraine, and the Russian army. Within hours of Russia's invasion, one pastor started holding prayer services every four hours, and he said, we received a revelation from God that we are to pray, and the more the church is praying, it destroys the enemy and destroys their ability to shoot at Ukrainian territories, civilian targets, and our Ukrainian military, he said. He firmly believes God is answering those prayers as Ukraine's military fights to rebuff Russian forces. Now, we do know there are talks going on between both sides as we worship this morning. We also know the attack continues, but we also know that the Russian military forces have faced much more resistance than they ever dreamed. This is not a popular war in Russia where the morale is sagging. 
because the people in Ukraine who are Christians are praying. It is not just a natural conflict, it is a spiritual warfare. And a spiritual battle must be fought with spiritual weapons. And so, we continue. He says, you cannot underestimate just how precarious the church sits geographically, for on the western edge of Kiev, this church being referred to is six miles away from the Russian forces at this point. The pastor says, we are the church. We stay here and we do not run from war. I might add, church history says Christians don't run during pandemics for the basement. They serve, they take risks, and they make a difference. And you haven't done that. We have served the city. We have served the community for two years. And that's why today Pearl Side Church is referenced with respect because you refused to live for self-preservation. You took risk to work on serve teams and to make a difference. Listen, explosions do little, he said, to deter an army of volunteers who've been coming to the church every day since war started to sort pack and gather relief supplies. Volunteer, volunteers, including children, they say, even though we hear the explosions, and sometimes they are very close, quote, we just continue doing our ministry to help those who are in deeper need than we are, and that's why we're not scared at all. We feel good because we know that we're doing something very important. Listen to this. The church has so far helped 60,000 people since Russia's invasion, and they tell this humanitarian effort is going to continue for as long as it takes, and in the meantime, their focus is on Russia. Hmm. And they are praying for a major spiritual breakthrough there. Another pastor is urging Christians worldwide to not only pray for Ukraine, but also for Russia as they endure unprecedented political and economic upheaval. He said, this is my prayer. God, if you could save Nineveh, please save Russia as well. This pastor believes the war will somehow bring a spiritual breakthrough in Russia leading to greater religious freedom. The word of Jesus Christ, he said, will be freely preached in Russia. He said, I firmly believe this and that time will come. Mark my word, you will see it. I'm old enough to tell you this has happened before in history, not only in Russia, but the entire Soviet Union, which is a coalition of communist bloc nations that put Christians to death, kept faith out. And that was in the 1980s when two massive prayer meetings called Washington for, Washington for Jesus put nearly two million people in a prayer meeting on the Capitol lawn. I was at one of them. Ronald Reagan was the president. He was a Christian. This is not a political statement, okay? Everybody just chill out. Ronald Reagan endorsed that, came out to pray with us. And after his tenure was done, because he knew, he said, I know I am president. After he got shot, because they tried to take him out. He says, I'm president for one reason only, to end the Cold War. This was not just Russia invading Ukraine. This was the United States and the Soviet Union at odds with a nuclear trigger at their fingers. Who's going to shoot first? That tension riveted a world. And God intervened. And he dismantled the Soviet Union. And he decimated Russia. The landscape changed. Churches were planted throughout the Soviet Union, Russia included. Missionaries went to places they had never gone before because God intervened, because Christians rose up and said, we are going to pray for a breakthrough, and then we are going to go make disciples and express love to people Jesus died for as well. And that is our call. And when we saw Judge Tammy Kemp get off behind her bench, get on ground level with Officer Amber Geiger, and she, when she began to minister Scripture and pray for her and hug her, that was a model of the first steps of making disciples, fulfilling the very word Jesus leaves all of us with. At the end of the day, when we stand before God, one of the questions he will ask us is, how did you do with my last command of making disciples? What I love 
is that probably the entry phase to making disciples is serving in practical ways. And we see the Ukrainian church standing in the war zone, ministering love to people of their own nation, but also Russian military are dropping their weapons and they are asking for asylum and they, they are crossing over and wanting to become part of the Ukrainian people because this is, they know this is an unjust war. And the Ukrainian people, without asking any questions about who have you shot, how engaged were you, are receiving them with agapeo love and feeding the very military force that were assigned to obliterate them. That's the love of God. And that's the love that will transform our world. And when we choose this, we put on love, this is the love that will transform your world. Because all of us have people that tick us off. All of us have family members that we would never give to our own family if we were God. All of us have bosses that are not as good as I am to my staff. <laughs> Actually, I'm sure they wanted to kind of, you know, put me out of my misery at some point in time over the years. But you know what I'm saying. We have people in Hawaii now that have been ravaged relationally. We are in this series because we are trying to address a need in society here. Divorce rate is way up. Abuse rate is way up. Relationships have been strained. We've been told to stay apart, wear your mask, keep your distance. And people have been at each other's throats with opinions and differences for two years. I want to say right now, this pandemic has ended. Politicians will try to keep it alive, and we need to look at it with biblical eyes. I was in prayer for about an hour and 12 minutes yesterday. I was telling Faye, and I said, I, I can't say 100% because I'm not a biblical, I don't hold the biblical office of a prophet, but I'm pretty sure that I just, the Lord just showed me a picture of him sucking the coronavirus off the earth, you know, like, that's my best imitation. and breathing revival into the earth. And it would behoove us by faith to choose the courage to begin to serve the world by love as Galatians 5, 13 and 14 says. It is not a time anymore to stay in the basement. We cannot live with self-preservation. We must serve. We need, as people come back and we near Easter, you look around, this is Easter break, so we have a lot of families out. They're on the mainland, uh, they're staycationing, all right, and the private schools have now started their break. But people are coming out, and every church pastor that I know tells me that people that are unchurched and dechurched are coming. We are about to enter a historic post-pandemic revival and awakening, the likes we have not seen in decades. And what that means is we need people not just coming to church, but serving in church, serving through the church. You've done that. We have a, a food bank drive again. We have a blood bank. We're hosting that again. That's coming up real shortly. We have been consistently doing food bank, blood bank, school mentoring, school supply drives, feeding the poor. We have been commended publicly for being one of the churches that have served our community and city throughout the pandemic. That's because you are the church. You have not given in to fear and self-preservation. You've become part of serve teams. You've put yourself at risk, shoulder to shoulder, to pray for, serve in practical ways the public. And now, we are about to see God move in a mighty way. But I'm making an appeal like you saw in the Ukrainian church. We need, we don't need greeters. We got enough of those. We need ushers. We need kids ministry workers. We need shuttle drivers. We need parking attendants.
We need now all of us not only to return to attend, but engage to serve. The infrastructure for the harvest must be built. You know, Jesus always said the harvest is not the issue, but the laborers are few. As your pastor, I am appealing to you to find a role if you do not yet have one and join the crew that by love will serve others. Can I hear an amen? Ponder that. We have sign-ups in the lobby. And understand, I don't want you to feel pressured today. By love, serve, because I believe God will meet the need. But we live in a tremendous, tremendous day. You know, sometimes I get it. Some people say, well, I feel like it's safe to return to attend, but I'm not sure it's, it's safe to serve. Let me unplug for a while. I've not lived in a basement as your pastor. I've been out and about from the time this thing began. Now, I've traveled. I've been to Florida where, like, there never has been a pandemic, where nobody wears masks, and the positivity rate was high, and everything was just going off because they chose to let people choose. I spent a week there without a mask, at a conference, this is a year ago, 1,200 people in a room, I'm in the front row because I was part of the North American leadership team of our every nation family of churches. I was in sessions all day long, up close with people, eating meals without a mask. I never caught the coronavirus. Now, let me be careful when I say this. I eat right, I exercise, I took all the protocols, I researched what I could be done to protect myself, and you know my stand. I blogged on the vaccine. But I told myself, I am not going to live in fear. I am going to choose faith over fear because God is my protector because I have got to serve the flock and the community and the city. And I have got to be able to connect with people's lives. But I also know in God's sovereignty, it says, well, look, if this is the way I die, then I die because the only way I die is, not, is that God wants me to die. He's sovereign. You know, there's people here. I mean, we can do everything. In fact, wear a helmet, live in a bubble, and still die because God is the one who determines when we live and when we die and how we die. But the concern is God is going to one day judge our lives for how we've lived and how we've served. And I made peace with this in the pandemic that, you know what? If I'm going to die because of the coronavirus, then I'm going to die in the will of God. I'm going, to die, I'm going to go down loving and serving others with courage. And I'm not going to die playing defense in self-preservation wearing a motorcycle helmet. It's time we serve and not just attend. It's time we be the church, just like you see in your crane. And it's time we take to the next level who you've already been. Because Hawaii has loved Pearlside Church for serving from the beginning of this pandemic. But because more people are coming, we now need more people to be serving. And in the lobby, you'll, you'll see some opportunities because as the closer we get to Palm Sunday and Easter, the more you're going to see who the Holy Spirit has prepared to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live in great days. You're part of history. I was the product of the last revival. I know you're going, we know you're old. I saw the Soviet Union crumble. I saw missionary teams enter Russia. God wants to do it again. Worldwide pandemic, political division, and Russia added again. Old guys like me go, I recognize this picture. It's the stage for what God wants to bring, which is a global revival and spiritual awakening. You live in great days. God wants to do it again, and he has already begun.